Good morning, Harvest. Welcome to our live stream for this Sunday. Um, anyone else tired of washing their hands? I know I am. After this is done, I'm never doing that again. Okay, let me open us in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for uh, just continually watching over us during this time, Lord, and we, um, you know, we pray, Lord, that we would have faith, Lord, that, um, that you'd continue to protect us and watch over us and that you are um, a God worthy of all our praise, of all the glory, Lord, and that you are all-powerful. Lord, we uh, thank you for um, just, uh, just this live stream and has helping uh, everything kind of get worked out and helping us to uh, still meet and um, be a church, even though it's uh, kind of a virtual thing. Lord, we pray um, during this reopening that you would give the, the church and the congregation and the leadership just wisdom and how to open and um, just pray for uh, just patience and uh, um, just uh, flexibility on the part of everyone involved. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Stir in me the fire that my heart cannot contain. I come to worship you. Stir in me a passion that the world cannot explain. I come to worship you. Hold me, break me, mold me and make me more and more like you. I come to worship you, love you, fear you, draw ever near you as I worship you. I come to worship you. Stirring me, a fire that my heart cannot contain. I come to worship you. in me a passion that the world cannot explain and I come to worship you hold me break me hold me and make me more and more like you. I come to worship you Love you, fear you, draw heaven in you as I worship you. I come to worship you. Hold me, hold me, break me, mold me, and make me more and more like you. I come to worship.
emotion that the world cannot explain I come to worship Heart and flesh cry out, you the living God. 
I'll try to hide you, steal you away. They'll try to keep you inside of the grave. Enemy fun, kind but he lost. You cannot be stopped. We cry for freedom, tore down the wall. Weight of our burdens, carried it all. And our failings dead on the cross. Oh, you cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, battle is won. Nothing can stand. Against our God Stand on your leg Shout out your praise Miracle maker Mighty to save Awesome in power Landless in love I can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God It's nothing, there is nothing You cannot be stopped There's nothing that can stop our God There's nothing that can stop our God There's nothing that can stop our God There is nothing, there is nothing Breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. Mover, mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah. So Lord, nothing can stand against you, Lord, and we pray that during this time, Lord, as we um, just um, don't know what's next, feel anxious and feel like um, just there's sickness all around us, Lord, we pray that we would put our faith and trust in you, have peace, that our God is, um, is a powerful God, is a, is a unbeatable. Well, we pray for Pastor Gerald now that you would speak through him as he starts a new series um, in Philippines. Lord, in your name, amen. Good morning. Um, the scripture reading for today comes from Philippians 4, verses 5 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. 
but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning, I want to start a new series called Obstacles to Life. And it just comes from this idea that sometimes um, our most serious obstacles aren't even um, what we see in front of us. It's more so what's happening inside of us. Here's an example of what I mean. I think by now, all of us know that part of doing life in this broken world is that we're gonna face trials and tribulations of many kind. But what I'm learning is that the way that I respond can really make all the difference. Because see, you can have a situation that's bad enough as it is, but if you respond well, then, then you probably can weather any storm. Or you can take that same situation that's already bad, but if I respond very poorly, then I can make things infinitely worse. But really, for most of us, our ability to respond well has a lot to do with how we're doing. This is just one example of many. And so I'm calling this series Obstacles to Life because I wanna address this part of our lives that's just so important, what's going on inside our hearts. And so this morning, to kick off this series, I want to preach a message called Anxiety. Perhaps we could define anxiety as our physical and emotional response to fear. It's physical because our, our teeth are clenched, our hands are balled up in fists. Maybe sometimes you feel that anxiety in your shoulders. That's why we get massages. But it's emotional too. We feel that fear on our hearts. Now, for myself, um, Eric, I need your help here. Um, for the last I would say close to 30 years of my life, um, I've had this recurring nightmare. It's always the same thing. In my dream, I'm, I'm driving this car when I realized to my horror that um, I can't actually touch the steering wheel. So I start to panic. The car begins to drive faster and faster. It even begins to veer wildly off course. And I'm doing everything I can in my dream to, to grab that steering wheel, to right the course, but no matter how hard I try, I just can't. And this nightmare, it always ends in the same way. I slam into this wall, and then I wake up in this cold sweat. You don't have to be Sigmund Freud to, to figure out what's going on with me. Um, you see, this nightmare only comes when I'm under a lot of stress, when it feels like life is just moving so fast. It's taking all these turns that he didn't anticipate and I feel like my life is just spinning wildly out of control. And there are so many counseling theories out there that tell us that there is this direct relationship between all of our worries and this one singular issue of control. Which is why the words that the Apostle Paul has for us in the passage for this morning's message really are helpful. Because he reminds me that wherever I find myself in life today, that my God is still near. Because you see, the way that we fight our anxieties is on our knees in prayer. And the best rescue from a sea of worries is by turning it back to the Lord. So this morning, I want to address this critical need that all of us face in life about how we can find the very peace of God no matter where we are through prayer. And so what I wanna to do today is I wanna share with you four principles that Paul is giving to us about how we can find the peace of God no matter what you're facing today. So let's get to it. The very first principle that Paul gives us about how we can find the peace of God through our prayers is perhaps the starting point for all of our prayers. When we pray, we draw near to God. You see, in the original language, there's these four words in verse five that set the context for all that Paul has to say about prayer today. The Lord is near. Because what Paul was saying is that when we can see that this is true, that we will find the peace of God. But really, there is no assurance, no matter how much I pray, if I can't see this to be true. 
And so these four little words, they shape the entire experience that all of us will have with prayer. Can we see that the Lord is still with us? Now, in the beginning of the year, probably in January or February, before this whole pandemic hit, um, I remember there was this one day when I was picking up my seven-year-old Josh from school after the whole day was over. And I remember that he was very clingy that day. First thing he said when he saw me is, Daddy, I need a hug, and so I gave him a hug. And we got home, he was just sort of like following me around wherever I went. I'd get up, and I'd go to another room, and then, so he would get up and we'd follow me there. And he just kept asking, Daddy, I, I need a hug, and so I gave him a hug. And it almost felt like he was the second skin on my rib cage, just very, very clingy. And after a while, um, I kind of figured out that something was bothering him. And so I sat him down and, and I asked him, Josh, what's the matter? Why the long face? And what he told me was that there was this classmate at his school that he had thought was his friend. And, and this is crazy. But that day, his friend had actually pulled scissors on him and swung it at his head. And literally, for the next five minutes, literally, I'm not sure if this kid thought it was being funny or, or if it was something else. But for five straight minutes, he chased Josh around the room with these scissors in his hand. And then eventually this teacher intervened and kind of shut everything down. But what he kept saying to me was, that was just so wrong, Daddy. That was just so wrong. And I realized that what Josh was doing was he had felt that there was just something so extreme. There was something so off about this situation that, that he needed to tell an authority figure what had happened. Someone that he knew was good, someone that he could trust, cared about him, that some authority that he could trust would do the right thing, needed to know what happened. Paul here is doing something very similar for us today. He's reminding us that no matter how old we get, no matter how successful one day you become, in all of life, every single one of us will always need someone who's greater than ourselves. Because really, what Paul is saying is even more than all the wisdom that he'll share with us about prayer, even more than finding answers to every question that we face today, really, it's the nearness of God that's ultimately going to bring us the peace that we're looking for. And so Paul shares us a little bit of truth. Here is the starting point for all of our prayers. No matter where life may take me one day, no matter what kind of hardship I might face, we must always remember that our God is still near. Well, he gives us a second principle about how to find the peace of God through prayer. He tells us that when we pray, we cast our burdens upon him. He's explaining what happens when we pray we give up our burdens to him. If you could imagine with me that you've gone fishing one day, kind of like this person right here. Um, you're on a boat and you have this big, heavy net. And what you do next is you cast that net, all of it, upon the waters. Paul is saying that this is what happens when we pray. We give it all up to the Lord. You know, that day with the scissor incident um, where the kid was running after Josh with the scissor, I, I remember there were two things that needed to happen before Josh could calm down. First of all, he already shared with you, he, he needed to get as close to me as possible. He, he just wanted a hug. Daddy, I need a hug. He just physically had to nestle into my rib cage. But number two, he needed to spill his guts. And once he started, there was like no stopping him. It, it almost felt like if you could see that dam in front of you and then there's a breach and then this tidal wave of water just explodes out of it. That's, that's what it felt like for me on that day. This, this torrent of words just came flowing, just came pouring out of him. And he started telling me all these different things, how there were these four other boys that were sitting around the table. They saw it all, Daddy, is what he said. This is their names. Then he started telling me, well, this was this assignment the teacher had asked us to do, and, and I was only doing the assignment. I wasn't even doing anything wrong. I was just doing what the teacher told me. 
And then he kept saying the same thing over and over again. It was just so wrong, Daddy. What he did was just wrong. He was saying, Daddy, I don't even know if I'm gonna go back to school ever again. I don't ever want to see that little boy ever again because it was just so wrong. And as I watched him, as he was just sharing this tidal wave of words, it was unloading on me. I think what Josh had instinctively figured out was what happened was so extreme that he just could not bear it on his own. And Paul is telling us something very similar about prayer today, that when we pray, we Give it all up unto the Lord. Look what he says next as he speaks to us about prayer. The Lord is near, so do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Anything, everything, you can cast all of it upon the Lord. You know, to be completely honest with you, um, by nature, I'm, I'm not a very good listener. This is something that the Lord has convicted me of um, throughout my life, that I need to grow as a listener. And so I'm still a work in progress. I, I still have a long way to go. And so I don't say this necessarily because I'm trying to be funny, just more as an admission. But that day, Josh really did have a lot to say. And I have to confess to you, as, as the time went on, I started to feel a little impatient. Um, there was a side to me that, that kind of wanted to hurry him up, right? Josh, wrap it up. Can you just summarize it? I get the point, right? Is there something specific you would like Daddy to do? Let, let's wrap it up here. But as I saw Josh, and at one point he was sobbing, and I don't blame him. He's seven years old, and someone was chasing him with scissors. And as I saw how rattled he was, Somewhere along the way, I decided that I would let Josh share as long as he needed to. And I think you can probably see where I'm going with this. It's that old, familiar, lesser to greater argument that if even someone as flawed of a human being as myself, of course, is going to make time for Josh when he needs me, then how much more can you trust that your Father in heaven above, who's perfect, whose love is infinite when it comes to you and unending, wants to hear from you. First Peter 5, 7, where we see that same idea of casting it all upon the Lord. Cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Because we have a God who's not only able to carry your load, but he wants to as well. You know, verse 7 Paul says something that's a little bit peculiar. He says that this peace of God surpasses all understanding. Some of your translations say that it transcends all understanding because this peace of God is beyond human understanding. What is he talking about? I think it's something like this. Have you ever been thrown a curveball in life and you find yourself in a predicament that you never thought you would be in, and you definitely don't appreciate it. You didn't ask for this. You've ever been hurt by another person. They treated you very unfairly. Um, Maybe they were someone that you really cared about, but they were taken away from you prematurely. Perhaps they passed away. Have you ever um, been in a relationship and it just ended in a very painful way? And after everything was said and done, it almost felt like your heart had been trampled on and shattered into a million different pieces. Um, Have you ever been backed into a corner and it just seemed like there was no way out? Then if you have, I think probably what most of us experience is all the questions begin to come. Why did this happen? Did I do something wrong? Will this ever end? And it's interesting because what I think is for many of us, we know there are no answers to these questions, yet we ask them anyway, over and over and over again. When we're still dating, did she really mean in a sincere way all the things that she promised to me? What was she thinking when she did it? And why did she do it? And we just keep asking these questions over and over and over again 
even though we know we'll never know the answers. And here is the hard truth to it all. The reality of it all is even if somehow we were able to gain access to all the answers, to all the questions that are hiding inside of our hearts, it wouldn't do you any good because what's done is done and we can't turn back time. And so Paul is making an observation about life that is so true. Logic doesn't give peace. Only God can give you peace. But God has a peace that's so true, that's so strong, it can be yours even though you don't have all the answers to all the questions that run through your heart today. And so Paul tells us something that is so wise today. Be like a child with your father with whatever it is that maybe we are facing in life today, relationships, whether in our family or with our friends or with someone else, um, work, school, our money even, maybe even our health, all the different wrinkles that come as part of living life in a broken world. Paul encourages you, be like a child with your father and cast all your cares upon him. But there's a third principle that he shares with us today about prayer. He explains to us that when we pray, regardless of where I find myself one day in life, the atmosphere shifts. You know, um, one result of this quarantine is that I, I, I spend a lot more time with Josh than I normally do. It, it feels like every one of his waking moments, literally every waking moment, I spend with him every day, seven days a week. And so one blessing of this quarantine is I feel that Josh and I have gotten so much closer just because of sheer volume of hours that we spend together. And I noticed that there's a very predictable pattern when it comes to my seven-year-old boy. Something happens to him and he gets his feelings hurt and he begins to cry, ah, right? This was so wrong. Then he comes over to me and he says, Daddy, I need a hug and I give him a hug. He starts to tell me what happened. This was so wrong, daddy. But then I notice something happens nine out of 10 times. After about 20 or 30 minutes, this big smile breaks across his face. He starts running around in circles. He starts to laugh out loud. And it's almost as if whatever was troubling his little soul is now effectively behind him. And I think that, to be quite honest, um, it's really helpful for me to understand this passage. Because before this whole lockdown went into effect, I, I never really fully understood what Paul was saying here. You see, in verse four, right before he starts talking to us about prayer, he says something that always confused me. Paul calls us to rejoice always. And I don't know about you, but how are we supposed to do that? How do we always rejoice when we know that life is not always joyful? And then he says something similar in verse six when he's calling us to pray for the peace of God. He slips in there, but pray thankfully. And again, I don't know about you, but, but sometimes I'm not just in the mood to thank anyone. And so Paul, what are you doing here? How can you call us to rejoice when we all know that oftentimes life isn't joyful at all? What are you doing here? And so before this quarantine hit, this is the way that I used to preach this very passage. We need to command our souls to be rejoiceful. We need to command ourselves to be thankful no matter what. But again, I, I don't know about you, but for me, I've tried this enough times where it just doesn't work for me. Because for me, the problem is, is I just can't force myself to feel things that I just don't. And when I try to do it, I, I feel like I get twisted all off in these knots inside my heart and my mind because I feel like I'm playing these weird psychological games with myself, trying to convince myself that I'm seeing something that isn't really there. So Paul, what are you doing here? Asking us to feel things that we genuinely don't. 
Well, see, there's this one little verse in between verses four and six that help us to make sense of it all. It's verse five where Paul tells us that the Lord is near. In the original language, this is what makes sense of it all. Because what Paul is saying is that joy and peace are the result of the one who is near to God. Here is the wisdom for life. The difference between just sitting there and truly finding joy for our lives is him. I think with my son Josh that in many ways he's liked as a bloodhound. He can sniff out people's true character. And I think for many little kids, they're sort of like that. They're, they're more discerning than we give them credit for. They, when they can tell that, that a person isn't kind, when they sense that a person isn't gonna be patient with them, then they just won't go to them. Because for most little kids, they only talk to adults that they believe are helpful to them. And to me, that's very helpful in understanding this whole process of prayer. Because everything can be blowing up around me, but when I discipline myself to spend that 10, 15 minutes with the Lord, he often takes me to a place where I can see and remember him once again. Because what I need is for God to convince me that he is good that he is still right here with me physically. And so I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm. And here Paul is telling us something that I consider beautiful when it comes to pray. That no matter what I'm going through in all of this life, when I pray, the very atmosphere shifts because now I can see God and he makes my heart glad. There's one fourth and final principle about prayer that Paul shares with us today. He says, when we pray, we're guarded by the peace of God in Christ. There's something so profound about these words. But what does he mean that this peace is found in Christ? I think it's like this. Tell me if you agree. But one thing I notice about this lock-in is that for most people, what we think is the solution to everything that we're going through is for the virus to just go away. That, you know, when we can go back to life the way it used to be, um, when I can sit inside that restaurant and enjoy my food, um, when you can go back to Manhattan Beach and play volleyball and Memorial Day like we used to, when life can just be normal again, when it can just be the way it was before all this craziness happened, well, then all my problems will just go away. But is that really true? Because there's something about it that seems like an unsatisfactory answer to me. You know, philosophers say that there's these six existential questions that have plagued humanity way before COVID-19 came since the beginning of time. Tell me what you think. Do you think the earliest humans struggled with these questions? Will I be okay? Did Adam and Eve wrestle with the answer to this question? Am I secure? Am I loved? Or am I all alone? Are these questions that have plagued the first humans. What will become of me? Is there a purpose or a reason for the entirety of my life? And it just seems to me that these are questions that were not created by COVID-19, but are just part of the human condition. It doesn't seem realistic to me that one vaccine will chase all of our problems away. Most likely what will happen is we'll be okay for a day or two and then something else will happen. And that these same questions that have plagued all humans that have walked the face of this earth will be kicked up once again. And so Paul says something that I think truly addresses everything that's going on. He tells us in verse seven that there is a peace from God that's in Christ Jesus. What is he talking about? To be completely honest with you, I don't think I can fully explain this in three minutes because it's above human understanding. But what is he talking about? 
Here's what he's saying. He's saying that when we pray, we can actually connect to God in a way where we actually draw down from heaven the same peace that God himself experiences in heaven. And if you could imagine that you yourself were timeless, and so you could see how all the things that you're going through are gonna work themselves out. If you could picture yourself as the most powerful being in this entire universe, if you could imagine that you were given all the wisdom in this world, there was no question that you're having today that you couldn't figure out somehow. If perhaps you were perfect, you had never made a mistake, you didn't have to worry about messing everything up because you're perfect, everything you do is the best decision. Can you imagine what kind of peace you would have today? There is a very critical truth about prayer that Paul is trying to explain to us today. That when we pray, on a certain level, we're actually drawing down the very peace that God himself experiences. You know, I imagine that for different people, the the tension as we listen to this message today is this, It's not that I don't agree with what you're saying. I I can read for myself. I, I see that that's what Paul was saying on that day. But see, the tension that I feel is that you don't know me. You don't really know everything that I'm going through today. And see, the truth of it all is it's a little bit more complicated than what you're describing here. And so how can you say these words when you don't really know me? And it's true, I, I don't know what every one of us are going through today. But what I can say is that Paul knew life. You see, this book of Philippians is considered a prison epistle because all the while he's talking about joy and peace, he's writing from inside a jail cell. He was imprisoned and sitting in chains. And this letter of Philippians is actually one of the final letters that Paul ever writes. Because what most people believe is shortly thereafter, they take him off to be executed and they cut his head off. And so Paul definitely knew, of all people, what it was like to be backed into this corner, to have seemingly no way out. But yet, despite it all, as he talks about joy always and peace no matter what, he discovered in the midst of it all a certain truth about life. That true peace, the peace of God, doesn't come in the absence of problems. Real peace comes in the presence of Christ. And he says something here that's so comforting. He says that this peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that word guard, of course, is a military term. It's oftentimes used in times of war when a general would send off the majority of his army to fight some important battle in a faraway land. But sometimes that general would ask a few of his best men to stay behind and guard the villages. Why? Because there is something very important left behind in those villages. Life. Maybe even the lives of his very own family, his wife and his children, and so he would ask some of his best men to stick behind and guard those villages. And Paul is saying that this peace of God can guard your very hearts and minds on every side because God knows that there's something very, very valuable inside, your very life. You know, this past week as I was preparing for this message, I somehow stumbled across this picture um, describing Jesus Christ on the internet. I'm told that it's from this mini-series that had recently aired called The Chosen. And for some reason, I. I just found myself mesmerized by this picture because it so perfectly captures how I understand God looks at me. Just that smile on his face, that that beard maybe scratching the person's neck. But the part that just intrigued me, that just grabbed me for some reason, was he just looked so happy as he embraced this young man. And this is what Paul is saying today. Ultimately, when we pray, we look back at him. 
And I hope for every single one of us that we find ways regularly to go to the Lord in prayer so that we can see him once again. Maybe you're a visual person like me and so pictures like this, you, you find it helpful. Or maybe you look into the word and you see how exactly God sees you when he looks at you. But here is what Paul is telling us today. The power of prayer is when we remember him, when we can see once again that he is with you, when you're willing to cast all your cares upon him. He makes us glad and he gives us peace. Let's pray. Let's just do that in this time. As we always do, I wanted to invite you to bow your heads with me for just a few moments and think and pray for yourself. What did Philippians 4 verses 4 through 7 truly say? Was God speaking to you today? And will you listen? You know, I know enough about life in this broken world that's filled with broken people to say that most likely most of us who are here today are going through something that weighs our hearts down. A relationship with another family member or a loved one or a friend. Something at work, something at school, our money, our health. Millions of other ways that life in a broken world filled with broken people can weigh our hearts down. But if you are one of those people today, would you listen to the words of Scripture today? Cast it all upon the Lord. Be comforted with the truth that my God is still with you. Remember who he is and let him give you peace and let him make you glad. will not you just take a few moments to consider these things and to pray. Follow. 
the Lord. <coughs> we uh, we um, raise our, our prayers to you. We raise our praises to you. Lord, we, we, uh, we put all our, our faith and trust in you. Lord, we know that um, you are the good shepherd. Lord, that you are um, going to lead us um, to, um, to safe pastures. And we know we are safe in your arms, Lord. We thank you for um, just being who you are. We pray for this coming week that you would um, be glorified, Lord, through our lives, Lord, and that we can uh, just uh, yeah, really point to you wherever we go. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Harvest South Bay, and thank you once again for coming and worshiping with us. Here are a few announcements that I'd like to share with you today. Number one, um, we have this privilege of um, being able to get this inside peek into different people's lives across our congregation through these family updates. And so this morning, as we know that our brother Julian just got married a few weeks ago, um, he has graciously invited us into his life to see how his marriage been in the very first few weeks of this marriage that we believe will last across the span of his entire life. We hope that you will enjoy this update from Julian and Jalene Nieto. Hello everyone, this is Julian and Jalene. It's nice to see everyone. Uh, well, we just wanted to share with you that uh, this time in quarantine has been very interesting. As you may have heard, uh, we just got married last month and uh, that was uh, pretty funny. We went to Santa Barbara uh, for the, the, the ceremony thing and uh, the person who conducted the ceremony was in full plastic armor, had the full plastic wall, and they used like a pizza oven tray to hand us paperwork. And uh, it was a very interesting experience. <laughs> but uh, now we're home. So, yeah, how about, uh, go ahead, what do you want to share? Hi, everyone. I still didn't know much about you yet, but I'm looking for <laughs> that I can know you more um, about my sisters and brothers in Christ. And I hope we can have a chance soon that we can meet up or talk with each other. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so I guess one of the things that's been a blessing to us is that uh, since we've been home, uh, not going outside very much because of the quarantine, we've had a lot of opportunities to cook and have fun, making lots of food, and uh, it's just been a wonderful experience and uh, great to cook together and everything. So. Yeah, I uh, hope to see you guys soon and uh, look forward to all of the Zoom meetings and everything and, and hopefully we can get back together soon at church as well. Yeah, so anyway, thank you everyone. Uh, hope you have a idea of what we've been up to now. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing with us, Mr. and Mrs. Nieto, and definitely welcome to the Harvest South Bay family, Jaling. And I just wanted to give an encouragement to our church that we would commit to praying for this new marriage as it starts off, that God will be in the middle of this, this, this new union, that this would not be a marriage with two Christian people, that this would be a strong and mighty Christ-centered marriage. Welcome to the family. We're just so delighted to have you with us. Um, number two, just remember that today is a special day. We have a graduation Sunday, and it's going to start very, very soon at noon. Um, the details should have been sent out. It will be over a Zoom call. And we put it on GroupMe as well as email for how you can log in. And then finally, <clears throat> we always um, consider that tithes and offering is actually part of our worship service here at Harvest South Bay. So we encourage you to take some time to prayerfully consider what is the amount that the Lord is moving you to commit to give to this ministry. The way you do it is you mail your offering to 4565 Sherry Ann Lane in Torrance. 
attention English offering. The office will make sure that it gets to the right place. Well, let me offer a benediction, which is just my pastoral blessing over the church today. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the awesome and unending power of our Father in heaven above, the ever-present fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with all God's people who are gathered here today. Give us unending peace. Give us an ever-present joy because God's people know and are persuaded and are convinced that our God is with us today. And all God's people said amen. Go in peace. We hope that we will see you again next week, same time, same place.